You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Polk. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Shoe In Show, the Footwear Industries podcast. Uh, I don't know if you feel it out there, Matt, but uh, there's a little bit of a thaw happening. There is. I'm, I'm starting to feel a little bit of a spring fever, uh, getting out and about a lot more, hopefully. Um, having to put on, you know, instead of three layers of clothing, only two layers of clothing <laughs> now. Yeah. Um, you know, out there, but I will remind people as we start to get into the spring season to start taking your antihistamines. Uh, oh, it's a big issue for me, and uh, it's better to get ahead of it than than have a sneezing fit for eight straight weeks during spring. Especially here, man. The Mid Atlantic, there's like yellow everywhere, and it you can't yeah. avoid it. You cannot avoid it. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I think you know we've we've talked a lot. The industry is facing so many challenges on so many fronts. Um, we're dealing with economic issues, inflation issues. We're dealing with supply chain congestion, uh, <laughs> shortages. We're looking at factory worker shortages and labor rate increase. I mean, everything in every aspect of the footwear industry is challenged, and it becomes a point where I think we have to look at a new paradigm for how we're managing um, our operations, Matt. And I know you talk to a lot of CEOs and executives and that's a lot of what they're looking for right now. Correct. Yeah. Are you talking like the ultimate paradigm shift that we all are so familiar with? And we used to talk about paradigm shifts, like in a PowerPoint, a boardroom as if like, Oh, we're going to pop up a website. It's a paradigm shift. Like, no, no, no. That was child's (laughs) play. Right. I mean, goodness gracious. And I think that's why, uh, Darren Glenister is our, our guest today, the CEO of material exchange. That is a that's a paradigm shift, Darren, and you've been on Shoein before, but we want to welcome you back and bring you into this conversation about how material exchange is driving paradigm shifts that I think are really critical to the industry at a time when we when we need it most. Man, the foundation below us is constantly shaking, and uh, and so Darren, thanks for joining us today on the program. No, it's thank thanks. It's great to be here. It's it's been a while. I always enjoy doing your Shoein podcasts also reaching a great audience and you've been working closely with us um, to help support material exchange since its uh, inception which was back in 2017 2018 uh, a lot has happened in the last four years well wow, it's four years time really does go by quickly uh, in particular with some of the economic impacts the, the virus situation with covid and how that's disrupted supply chains but We've always remained true to our vision, which has been about digitizing material data to uh, connect footwear and apparel suppliers with buyers to help streamline the movement of that data between the two sides. And we, um, we've, we've been helped a lot with uh, COVID and the, the restrictions in travel in the need for digitalization. But we've seen that the industry really is now embracing a change um, on the digital front to get digital data available, to uh, have more sustainable information available, and to make this industry more efficient and less uh, wasteful. Yeah, so let's talk a bit about the platform just to remind people really quickly, and then let's get some updates to how the platforms change based on remote uh, work for workflows. Uh, changes in the supply chain, et cetera. But just to remind people, it's a it's a platform where brands, factories, and agents can go out and explore materials and find new materials. Uh, it also allows brands to create their own cultivated um, kind of exchange uh, of their trusted suppliers where their development teams and, and design teams can see materials in real time. Know if it's actually in stock. That's a big thing too. Uh, and then communicate with suppliers in real time. So it's this efficiency we're talking about where I always tell people like, I I believe Excel is a great tool. It may be one of the greatest tools in the, the history of productivity in terms of how we can you know put in data and move data and quantify data and, and all that. But it gets to, to a point where you, the spreadsheets aren't cutting it anymore in this environment, Darren. Like people simply can't take 
the Excel would make sense of all this data that they have to start collecting. You mentioned sustainability data and like carbon emission and, and footprint data and all like all this stuff. We have it all separated. We have all these file folders. We have all these email exchanges and something starts getting missed. And the, the ones and two misses start adding up into missed hours to missed days to missed weeks to, you know, and then the money with all that associated with it. So um, maybe you can just quickly share, you know, I, I think the most interesting thing is the filtering system on the platform. So if you're exploring, you can filter by the material and then, and then I think now you guys are building in sustainability filters where you can actually say, is it recycled? Is it bio to help people better find environmentally preferred materials much more quickly and efficiently? Is that correct? It, it is. And just to, so the audience understands, there's three parts to material exchange. We have what we call a, a marketplace, which is open. And the reason the marketplace exists is to connect buyers with new suppliers and suppliers with new buyers. It's um, a place to discover new materials and new relationships. So that's very important to our business and important to our customers. And then the second part is what we call um, an exchange, and that's a curated experience. We launched the first exchange, which was dedicated to denim about a year ago. Uh, I know denim's not really in the in the footwear space unless you put it on a shoe, but we saw there was a big opportunity in the denim space, space and it's been very successful. We're now going to be launching other exchanges which are more focused to a, a material type or a use case. So in the case of footwear, um, there will be a dedicated footwear exchange. We, uh, we also have a third part, which is really important to our business, which is what we call the brand material management system. And that's for brands to work with their preferred material suppliers or their uh, supplier matrix. And that's a private space within our system to access the data. But all three of these have the same level of sustainability information where you can filter materials by um, certificates or badges or standards. So for example, you could say that I want a leather, it needs to be leather working group gold or above, or you can even make a request out to our supplier network and say that you're looking for something that maybe isn't catalogued in our system. So sustainability is, is very important for us and we build it in on all three parts of our, um, of, of our software. So talk about how brands and we don't have to name names, but how are brands kind of, um, what's the onboarding process, right? How do they kind of take their, their Excel spreadsheet example that Andy has used um, and pivot into something that's digitized? What's that process like? And if I, I don't want to scare people away or like analog still and haven't done anything when the barrier of entry is pretty low, I would suspect, Darren. So walk us through that process of how you're engaging with brands and how they can engage, even if they are an analog company, if you will. Yeah, we, we have a really low threshold to enter the system. So any buyer can sign up as an individual in our system. They need to be appro approved by us because we don't want suppliers seeing other suppliers. So we need to make sure that a buyer is from a brand. We then give them access to the system. They can go in and they can start browsing all the materials from our suppliers. That's the first entry point, and it's really easy and low resistance. The second point is where we form a relationship with a brand and we start aggregating users from that brand into more of a private space. So that, that involves us building a relationship with a brand, but it's Again, very simple because a lot of the suppliers pre-exist in the system. So you're just allocating a space in your private area for those suppliers to move. And then you can start seeing materials that are more exclusive to you as a brand. And we do that through um, showrooms. So the suppliers can create a showroom. They can share that with a specific set of buyers from within a brand. And then only those buyers can see that. So that keeps the integrity of the material data the third part, which is the exchange, the exchange is typically run by a partner um, that we work with and the partner decides who can come in. So consider that it's almost like a, a trade show online, but it's 24-7, 365 days a year. And that's something that, again, is really easy to get into and it's really easy to discover new materials and new suppliers. Yeah, I, I liken it to – so this is – the reason why this was really set up was because – 
all these brands were asking the material suppliers for their spec sheets and the material suppliers were filling out spec sheets every single day. And all the companies are asking for the same information. They're just asking for it in different ways. So the material supplier then is doing nothing but filling out spec sheets instead of actually developing the new types of materials. There's no help for our supplier base to like actually get in and better understand what the brand wants beyond what's on that spec sheet to like work more closely. So it's kind of like, you know, and, and maybe I'll take the words out of Darren's mouth here. It's kind of like Facebook where someone's profiles are created. You're going to friend request them and pull them into your network. And then boom, all the profiles already set. You can see everything that you want on there. They can show you whatever they want. So I, I saw the other day and I do the, I did the demo. There's the platforms brand new. They just updated it uh, based on, brands needs and information there's 30,000 materials that you can explore now in the system um more and more suppliers are jumping on every day but you know what's really interesting is what what companies used to do like for example like wolverine worldwide would fly in you know select suppliers for a three-day kind of material fair at their headquarters and they would have designers and development teams walk through and a lot of other companies do this too deckers does it a lot you can't do that in this environment, right? People can't fly in. There's still restrictions. And then it becomes the fact that, you know, our designers and developers may not even be at the headquarters. They may not even want to come in. Uh, people from Asia may not want to come here. We may not want them to come here because of all the barriers and all the issues. So all of a sudden, you're able to develop and curate your own fly-in through material exchange, through your trusted suppliers, and actually have the same experience and make sure the designers are looking at who your trusted partners are. And I think that's so important to what you guys are doing is create there's, there's, you know, these, these kind of stovepipes you're creating where brands are like, we want to only have our trusted people uh, in there. So our designers are looking with people who have the compliance, right? We've audited these folks. We, we know there, there's no human rights issues. We know their chemicals are correct. We know all these different things we want. Um, but at the same time, if your sourcing team needs to go out and find new folks, they can go out onto the exchange and find that too. Darren, I, I am interested, in particularly on the on the trade show side of that, where you're curating these uh, kind of exhibitions, and I know that you're working with different groups right now to try to build that out. But it seems to me, and we've talked about this too, and you can share your thoughts on it. But the trade shows are great because you can walk the floor and find new things, but I also think they're really inefficient because if you are exploring something, maybe your eyes is caught by some glittery material and you go over there like, Oh, what's this? But then you don't even know if that company or that supplier has audits. You don't know if they're compliant on, you know, not just social, but the chemical side on all these different standards that brands have. And then all of a sudden you spent 30 minutes talking to them and realize you can't do business because they don't meet your standards. So I think there's this, the in-person events are coming back obviously, but there's gotta be, a better way to add that digital layer to make all the trade shows functional. So maybe talk about your vision and who you're working with and maybe you can share, can't share, but how that works, not just in the, you know, not just in the digital sense of running a digital show, but the physical show and how, if you have a profile material exchange, you can find those greater efficiencies. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think trade shows are great. Um, there's always, you know, a lot of suppliers there that have materials that they have visible and some under the counter, some are hidden. You don't really know a lot about those materials. It's very difficult to learn that in an efficient way. So one of the things that we've developed is that we've developed what we call Material Exchange Go, which is a mobile solution which um, connects a QR code from a material into the app and everything that is in material exchange, whether it be the test report certificates, the standards for the materials are, are connected to that QR code. So you can walk up to a booth, you can say, okay, I'm gonna scan the QR code for the booth. I'm gonna see the capability of the overall supplier. And then I can select materials and every one of those materials ends up in a on the go folder. And you can share them with your colleagues who maybe can't make the show in person. And if there's 3D materials ready and available, those can be used immediately in design. And it, it really is a perfect mix of, of physical and digital. We're working very closely with a big uh, denim show to, to be the first one to use our technology. And then uh, I can't share too many details, but we're going to be doing an interesting footwear event uh, in the summer as well, which will utilize that technology. And we see this as a really good way of 
having a person be there and being connected to a, a broader team that's spread out through the world and they become the eyes and the ears on the floor, but everyone gets the data and can see what's happening d- um, during the show. So that that's definitely an exciting uh, development. Fascinating, actually. Just t- thinking, just hearing you say that. First of all, I'm sad that someone can't take a picture and then have to email it to a team member, and then that team member have to download it into a folder and then have a subfolder for that material type, and then all of a sudden make sure everybody has the cloud password to see that, and then have a discussion eight weeks later. I'm I'm sad that we can no longer have that efficiency uh, <laughs> at the trade shows, but I I think it's really interesting where you're actually saying you can send someone on the ground. Uh, you can be directed by your design or development teams based on you know what they've curated in house of saying we want these patterns or these types. Look out for this stuff. Send them out. They go around, you know, grab the grab those images, send them back to the team, and the team says, "Yes, that looks really good. Find more of that, or talk more about this, or or whatever." And then facilitate like, real time. Like that's crazy to think about the ability to have someone a specialized curator walking the floor for you or several, and being able to get things in real time and have comments in real time while they're still walking the floor to go back and ask that question in person instead of taking it, you know, creating a time to call on zoom and cover it, you know, like the designer would be like, I really like this, but does this come in, you know, polyester and send them back over there and be like, Hey, does this come in polyester real time update? Yep. It does. We just communicated on the channel, like boom. So Matt, when we think about this stuff, it's like crazy what this, the efficient, like, I mean, I know I hype material exchange a lot, but I simply don't know why brands simply don't take advantage of the opportunity to take a demo of the, what this thing is doing. It's crazy, the efficiency. It is crazy efficiency. And I, what I want to explore next, Darren and Andy, is I want to use the M word. I'm already tired of the M word, but we're going to go there because it's on top of everyone's mind. Does anyone know what M word I'm talking about? <laughs> Meta. Yeah, I kind of guessed. So <laughs> I'm already tired of the metaverse, and I, I've already said to myself, I'm not going to step foot in the metaverse. But, Darren, as you're describing this from like a business efficiency perspective, it, it rather than go and hang out with people I don't know to talk about things I don't care about, this sounds like a really cool application that would ultimately seem to have some kind of value within a metaverse. It almost seems like you're halfway there, or maybe you're fully there. I'm not... I'm not technically astute as how it all works, but are you thinking about this too? Or is in five years from now, do you expect like everyone to go into a virtual, um, put on headsets and go in virtually and, and, and deal with material exchange and engage with suppliers? What's the next step? Or are you already there? Where What's the future hold? I think there's, there's two parts. There's the physical product creation, which um, can step into – an AR or VR world to make the design process more efficient. I think that that's already happening and it's going to continue to happen. But then the second part is the pure digital product creation for footwear in the metaverse, which has also happened. I mean, I'm sure you've seen Nike's acquisition of a metaverse specific company Mm -hmm. and they're hiring very aggressively in the metaverse space to, to produce physical products that are not physical they're actually digital i mean they're, they're real shoes but they're in a in a better sense and we we've been doing something a little kind of quiet behind the scenes and i'm going to give you a bit of a scoop on this oh so there we go so um we we've been you know in this business for almost four over four years now and we've we've had access to a lot of data so we we know a lot um what's happening in terms of trends around design um, material kind of visualization and we're, we're going to be launching something which is called Lucien and Lucien is named after a very famous uh, print designer called Lucien Day who happens to be British and we've de- developed an AI engine that can create um, digital materials itself and it can learn based on what's trending and it's absolutely incredible oh my god so uh, I can't show it to you because this is a voice only <laughs> um, podcast, but it's absolutely amazing, and we're launching it shortly. That's so it'll take the it'll take the trend line. Say a brand's looking at what's in the future, you can do a trend line analysis and use this to kind of say what's what's coming ahead that you don't even think about and have that develop out. That sounds absolutely. And I will remind people if you don't know Darren, Darren's background is in technology he's done vr and ar before for major companies including retail companies and shoe companies as well so the 
I think what's important is it's not um, – this isn't like smoke and mirrors. I think there's a lot of tech companies out there that have the smoke and mirrors, and there's a lot of marketing around it. But what I like about Darren and his team is it's a straight-up honest discussion about the efficiencies that it can create and how it can help you. They're not going to oversell what the platform can do now um, and what you can get out of it. And I do think there's – and Darren can talk about this too. There there are efficiencies with VR and AR, and then there's drawbacks too. It's, it can't do everything, but it can enhance things. This is why we say too, Darren, maybe I'm – I don't know how you think about it, but I'm like, if something can help you 75% better, everybody's looking for hundred percent golden bullet. It do- doesn't exist. Silver bullet does not exist. If something can help you to do something 75% better, you take it, right? Like that's what we're looking for is a little bit better. And I think you guys have d- really delivered on this in terms of, of that. And I would say too, you know, the, uh, the other aspect, and Darren, you can speak to this too. Um, because the supply chain and production shifts are occurring, and because we saw COVID shut down borders where materials couldn't transit, it makes it more important than ever to have like a map of suppliers. So when people are searching, I think sometimes people are making something in Vietnam and importing it from Korea and don't even realize there's a factory that supplies something similar down the street that you could explore and have it right next door with no d- disruption. And that's part of the filter too, right? You could filter by location or look to see where those folks are to make sure you're doing more local for local and your supply chain isn't stretched or have higher risk is that correct yes that is correct and i also see kind of a future i'm going to give you a glimpse of where i see see that our company going i think eventually we will have and this is going to sound very strange you know you said we've got over thirty thousand materials the materials will become less important it'd be more the needs of the brands and what they need to produce each season and mapping them against the capabilities of the suppliers and using AI to educate both sides on how we can make the supply chain better and make the process more sustainable. And that's where I see the future. And we've already developed that. Uh, We haven't launched it yet, but it's something else that we're gonna be bringing out, which will really help brands plan better, be more efficient, and suppliers not necessarily have to produce so many materials speculatively they can actually do it based on what the brands really want. And that's, I think, going to be an important uh, impact the material exchange can make from an environmental perspective. It's amazing stuff. Uh, so yeah, amazing. I think, but I do think that's the thing. It's that you have to have the data. You have to have it somewhere. An Excel spreadsheet is not going to tell you anything. It's not going to tie that together. You need data and essential material depository. So a lot of people think of PLMs and things like that, but this feeds into PLMs, this feeds into anything. You can pull it out in Excel if you want to. But I think the data centralization to where it will tell you wise things, right? I think that's the problem is we've got this data. We all have data, but we can't always make sense of it because it's not in a system that will visualize it for us or help tie things together. And I think we, that's the point of the Excel is it's done a really good job of giving us a place to put the data. But we're at a new paradigm where it's not telling us what we need to know. And it's fascinating, Darren, to hear like if you plug in data on your supplier side and you plug in data on the material side, and then all of a sudden you're like, I want, you know, this type of bio blend material. Who's the best supplier? Who's closer to my factory? Who has the cost range I'm looking for? Who can deliver on time because they have the capacity? And then all of a sudden it curates who the best partner is for you. And then it tells you who to work with. And then maybe you plug in your factory base somewhere else. Maybe, you know, maybe material exchange doesn't do it on the factory side, but uh, you tie in where your factory base is and say, I want to do this in Vietnam. Then it changes, right? And it says, okay, based on your location of Vietnam and your factory, this is the best factory to execute this product with these materials. It'll cut your time by two weeks and it will decrease your cost by X and your waste will decrease by Mm -hmm. X, right? Like that's what we're added to. I mean, if you, look at, if you look at a real world example, take something like Uber, you know, they have millions of drivers, but it knows which drivers to put for you, which is op- the drivers are optimized for your route of where you are and where you're going. And this is where we want to be in terms of optimization for the supply chain. It should adapt to what you need and where you are and what you want to produce. And you shouldn't actually need to do anything. 
You yeah. should just press a button. I think it's amazing because there's a lot of concern about how automation will take jobs away. And I, I think that's a legitimate concern in certain industries, but so much of it more is, is, is complementary. Like it, it adds to the, the job that currently exists and allows those people to keep their jobs and, and do them actually better because of all the data that's coming in and the inability to, to read it and analyze it and to have these algorithms and this, this AI do that for you will help drive those those efficiencies that will help free up space for people to do other things to focus on other uh, other priorities. So I think it's it's actually this one doesn't scare me. This actually makes me pretty excited about what the future looks like. Yeah, me too. All right. So uh, to learn more, they can go. They can just Google Material Exchange. I know we're going to try to set up a webinar in the near future to help showcase a new platform. If you've if you tested out Material Exchange in the past, this is. The new platform looks nothing like the old platform. It's been completely updated. Compl- the visuals have changed. Um, I think the user abilities changed a lot too, Darren, in terms of making it a lot easier to filter and search, uh, to help people find what they're looking for and explore and and pull things down. Um, is there anything that we missed that we need to talk about too about the platform today? I think we covered everything that material exchanges today. Um, also you've got a bit of a taste of what we're going to be doing in the future and of course we value customer feedback Um, we love hearing from brands and suppliers to make our our system better and I just one other thing I'd like to say is I I, I also see material exchange as a place for a lot of new innovation to exist and there is a lot of innovation on the sustainability side for example carbon footprint data there's um, a lot around efficiencies of delivering s- samples, and we see Material Exchange as the central hub for all of that data to live, and we can help kickstart a lot of those uh, new initiatives to reach the right audience. So I see us really as a as an ecosystem, and um, I just you know again would love to say thank you so much for uh, your support, uh, FDRA, and it's always good to be here on Shoein. Yeah, thanks, Darren. And folks, again, Google Material Exchange, contact them, do a demo. We talk about this all the time. What does it cost to call someone up and say, I'm really interested in this? Tell me how I can use it to make my business better. It costs it costs zero to do that, but it could be millions, if you're really big, hundreds of millions of dollars saved in time and efficiency in doing it this way um, throughout your supply chain. Um, and you could, I mean, that's the thing too, is we talk about uh, opt. It can also make your products so much better. You can add so much value. You can innovate your product so much more through these efficiencies and really drive dynamic change uh, to your product mix and to your bottom line. So do the demo. Well, I'll say that. Do the demo. Um, Material Exchange, just Google it and see. They have a team that will will help set that up and do that for you. And, and of course, we'll be talking more with them and working with them and giving feedback from the brand side about what else people are looking for. But I know we can't talk about what's coming up in the summer, Darren, but I'm really excited about that too, because I think that'll be a game changer and how f- the future of trade shows are operated. And I will say this, if someone's just setting up a website and they're putting up a profile, I mean, we already have LinkedIn. We already have Facebook. We, we already have all that. It de- like it doesn't work to digitize the same problems. You need a material exchange that provides solutions, real solutions um, and not just another profile on a website that you have to you have to go to and look at. So, uh, so again, thanks for that, folks. Shoeandshow.com is our website. It's all our episodes on there. We've been doing this for over five years now, which sounds crazy. But even if it even if it's at the very start, I feel like there's so much Matt relevance to leadership, to culture, to innovations that are still emerging. And I think there's a there's a canon that we have of of these shoe dialogues that matter not just in terms of of timeliness about what the data is saying from years back but like where we're headed and the trend lines and again the culture and leadership about how we're managing companies and managing change so please go back and listen to past episodes we encourage you to do that and drop us a line if you have questions about this if you want us to put you in contact with darren and material exchange happy to do that too uh but again uh darren and material exchange thanks for the work that you're doing we're really excited to see you guys build the future and work with you on that uh, and on behalf of Matt, myself, until next time, Shoe In is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. 
helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit fdra.org.